little madhouse surgery, it's business as usual. Whatever the pet. It's the first time we've had a skunk into the clinic. Whatever the problem. We've got a big eye socket just full of pus. Our vets are ready to tackle whatever comes through the doors. You should never be too embarrassed to bring your pet to see the vet. Animals can do some crazy things, and trust me, nothing will faze us. Each week, they'll meet exotic creatures, passionate pet owners. Everybody should really have a, well, at least one pet frog. And have the lowdown on all things animals. Welcome to Animal Madhouse. In the Animal Madhouse surgery tonight, Cat meets a dog with an antisocial habit. Does he do it every day? Every day. Yeah. Three, four times a day. James talks tough. This is a disease, OK? <laughs> Obesity is a disease. Yes. As he launches our very own fat camp, Martin encounters a fragile ferret. This ponga doesn't seem to be coping well at all. And Paul takes on a challenging operation. We're actually going to have to try and lift this whole area up and attach it to the skull, which I've never done before. Our vets may see all kinds of problems at the surgery, but tonight, Sherman the tortoise has an issue that's definitely a first for Cat. So, how can I help with Sherman today? Well, he's got a few behavioural problems. He's getting quite aggressive uh, towards my kittens. All right. Yes, he's um, chasing them and nipping their legs, feet, tails. He just runs at them and starts nipping. I'm worried that he's going to draw blood because he's getting quite vicious now. Really? So Very he's biting vicious. them hard enough to make them It does them make a meow. Yes, Sherman may look meek and mild, but he's wreaking havoc, and Sarah's had enough. When I feed the cats, uh, Sherman stalks the kittens um, straight in there. And just basically is a nuisance. Tortoises may not have any teeth, but that beak certainly delivers quite a bite. And as for their reputation as slow coaches... He's really fast, like, he just wants to go for not playing. Tries to corner them up a corner and uh, going for the cat's uh, ankles, their tails, and they're not looking. And he's a bit nasty sometimes. And there's not much that stops him. Apart from the odd tumble. I just wish there's something out there that we can do, because it's not nice. <laughs> he looks nice and healthy. He's got bright eyes, mouth yeah. is clean. His, um, his, you know, his scales and everything are good. Right, pop you down. I thought he'd need a mate, to be honest. I thought that's what his problem was. He was a bit frustrated. Tortoises are notorious sex maniacs, yeah. <laughs> um, but... They don't naturally live in groups, really. They're yeah. quite solitary creatures. So they have no particular play instinct or chase instincts, you know. So he's yeah. quite happy on his own. Oh, that's OK, then. Um, and also, he's still quite young yet, so whether he's reached sexual maturity is debatable. Yeah. I'm going to arrange for you to see a tortoise specialist, yeah. just for him to have um, a proper once-over. Yeah. And with any luck, yeah. give those poor pussycats some peace. I'm glad he's going to be referred. That way, then, we will know 100% then why he's the way he is. Certainly, you don't hear of uh, catnipping tortoises very often, but he's only two years old and tortoises live decades, so I think that we can uh, help him over this and um, give the pussycats a break. He's going to outlast them, to be fair. Find out if Sherman can be tamed later. Next in the waiting room is Michelle and a rather extraordinary pet. Wow, it's the first time we've had a skunk into the clinic. Originally, skunks were bred for fur before becoming pets. Although popular in the States, they're fairly rare in the UK. Skunks normally are really lively. They'll run about, but Reuben can't do that because he hasn't got the strength in his legs. He could just about waddle. It worries me because obviously he's only three, so I'd like to see if anything can be done to improve him. A skunk that doesn't scurry is a worry. But James has a more pressing concern. Right, OK, so first thing, have you had him descented? Well, he was already descented when I had okay. him, so he's not going to spray. They spray some horrible stuff. 
Skunks are famous for their stinky spray. It's been compared to rotten eggs, garlic and burnt rubber. But it's how they defend themselves in the wild. When a skunk feels threatened, they lift their tail and spray. It can travel up to 10 feet and temporarily blind their attacker. Descenting a skunk involves removing the scent glands from either side of the anus. Descenting is now illegal in the UK. So what's the problem with Reuben? He's having problems walking. Um, his walking's started to get worse and he's collapsing down on his one leg. He's not moving about very quickly, is he? And he's, I mean, the first thing, he's really round, isn't he? He's quite a big boy. I mean, really, he should be about that wide. So he's, he's quite overweight. So uh, how long have you had him? I've had him for about a year now, but he's actually about three years old. And the previous owners, do you know what sorts of things they fed him? All he told me was he was fed on vegetables, fruit, chicken, okay. pasta and malted milk biscuits. I think he's had too many biscuits and too much <laughs> pasta. Old x-rays of Reuben show the damage that can occur with a poor diet. This bone should have really nice straight edges, so he's really lacked calcium. And these are potentially old fractures, so he could have been not moving much because his bones have basically started to split and break. Obesity and poor diet can shorten a skunk's life, and Reuben's lack of mobility could be a sign he's in discomfort. This isn't normal for a skunk to sit on scales. A striped skunk like Reuben shouldn't weigh more than three kilograms, but at nearly four, Reuben is one fat skunk. Let's get some blood samples. We might struggle. Because of that layer of fat, I've got to hit a, a little vessel in his neck. The blood test will look for calcium deficiency, diabetes and organ damage. Good boy. However, getting the blood's proving to be a bit of a stinker. There's just so much fat over everything. <laughs> With the blood finally flowing, James can now work out a diet plan that should get Reuben's weight down. But there's no excuse for portly pets. That's good. You're the one feeding him, so you're the one that can get him back to being a, a nice, thin, active skunk rather than a lethargic sort right. of little ball sat in the corner. High OK? Five. Thank you. She needs to feed him less, you know. He doesn't go to the cupboard for his food. He doesn't open the tins. I didn't really feel that he was overweight. I did think it was perhaps something to do with his muscles, but no, I, was, I was quite surprised, but I think the vet would have had a shock if you'd have seen the size of my other two. Obesity in pets is no laughing matter. So later in the show, vet James and nurse Gemma are taking on the nation's podgy pets in our very own Fat Camp. And they're facing some serious challenges. He's heading for an early grave he if is. we don't get this yeah. under control. Plus... We're just going to check that it's not ice-cold water. Paul's on the receiving end of an enema, elephant style. And Cat encounters a very frustrated Staffy. With the testosterone still on board, there is always going to be that drive for him to do it. Next through the surgery doors is seven-year-old Staffordshire Bull Terrier Max with a rather embarrassing habit. As soon as, yeah, we, had as, soon him... as we had him, we started to, started to do it from, from day one. And because he's got no shame, he'll, he'll do it in front of anyone, anywhere. anywhere. So I'd like to try and find out what we can do about it, really. Fortunately for Aaron, Rio and Max, Cat's on hand to solve the mystery. How can we help today? Right, basically, um, Max has a bit of a problem. He masturbates. Is this a daily occurrence? Does he do yeah, it every day? Every, every day. Yeah. Yeah. From once to three, four times a day. Max was rescued by Aaron and Rio three years ago, having been mistreated. And from the start, he's been publicly playing with himself. It's like he's playing to start off with. Yeah. But then he gets more excited. And then that's when it all starts. He'll start by getting his leg behind his head. He falls over, um, his, his penis comes out, and he starts uh, masturbating. masturbating, basically. I mean, uh, if you allow him to continue, then, you know, I don't need to explain what happens after that. So I have to stop him before he gets that far, to be honest with you. Oh, he's starting. He's up. <laughs> 
So he'll do this for a good ten minutes. So when you watch him, mm -hmm. it's actually quite distressing, isn't it? it you is. can see how stressed and upset he sort of is with himself. Yeah. So you can so see he whines is, at yeah, us when he's trying it's to... It's causing him quite a lot of... Mm. Dis dis yeah, yeah, mental discomfort. distress. So one obvious solution to this problem is to have him castrated. OK. Because with the testosterone still on board, there is always going to be that drive for him to do mm. it. Yeah. And has that been discussed before? Yes. It's been discussed between us, and uh, right. I don't think that's um, we don't something want we wanted to do. to do. I mean, I, originally, I, I wanted to sort of try and breed him. I would really question the wisdom of breeding from him. Yes. To breed from a dog of a completely unknown history is not always the most wise mm. thing, because you don't know his pedigree, where he's come from, or anything like that. The other issue with staffies, they are unfortunately just incredibly overbred. There are hundreds and hundreds of them out there. It's a shame. Castration is the removal of both testicles, and for dogs it can be done from six months. It's a quick, safe and routine procedure which normally takes 30 to 40 minutes. The only other problem I had is my last dog was castrated because he had testicular cancer and yeah. uh, he died basically right. under, under anaesthetic, so... Yeah. Um, I'm well, I can, about... I can completely understand then your yeah, your concern. Doing it, you know, going but it again. I would, I would, you know, really stress that that's an extremely rare mm. occurrence, especially for a healthy dog. Mm -hmm. But of course, testicular cancer is a risk of leaving mm. a dog entire, and particularly if it is advanced, you're you're then anaesthetising a sick animal to remove a tumour. Mm. Whereas what we would be doing in him is anaesthetising a healthy animal to remove normal organs. So the risks are already much less than in that particular situation. Okay. I think if we do castrate him, it is going to help. Mm -hmm. It is not an instant cure-all. This behaviour is now ingrained, he will carry on, but it will significantly decline. It is distressing him, and uh, that's the last thing I want, really. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I will yeah. be giving it some yeah. thought. Come on, Max. Yes, there is a masturbation component to this behaviour, but I think it's also born out of boredom, frustration, habit. There's a lot more going on here than just an excessive masturbator. Just give us definitely something to think about getting Max castrated. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like it done personally, but the uh, vets, vets reassured me that it's uh, fine for the dog. I think it would be a great idea for Erin and Rio to go to Birmingham Dogs Home and to see all the unwanted puppies there because I think until you see it, it's very, very difficult to realise what a big problem it is. But will a visit to Birmingham Dogs Home convince Aaron and Rio to get Max castrated? <laughs> it's going to take them all. We're travelling the country to give you plenty of advice about caring for animals. So we're better to start than with people passionate about their pets. What are most 14-year-old boys into? Football, computers, clothes? Everybody should really have a, at least one pet frog. In this seemingly typical semi lives Alex, who currently shares his bedroom with 16 frogs and toads. I got into frogs because I just was really attracted to them. They're such interesting creatures. I've got six African claw frogs and here's Enipus levis. Uh, my juvenile cane toad. This is uh, my fantasy horned frog and he's actually bred in Russia in a lab. But Alex's room is home to more than just frogs. I think I know most of what's in there. I think I do. He's got his millipede. I quite like those. Um, cockroaches. Oh dear. Oh yes, he's got a couple of snakes. <laughs> The only thing I have really drawn the line at is rats. His exotic pet passion started with Bruce, the bearded dragon, originally bought for his brother. After that, it's all a bit of a blur. I'm not sure how I got my other animals, but I've been acquiring things ever since. We were a bit concerned that Bruce was going to live so long and everyone was going to go off to university and leave us with Bruce. Now, they're going to go off to university and leave us with Bruce and millipedes and cockroaches and snakes and... Wow. <laughs> Quite a lot of things. When I get home from school, I check them, I feed them, I clean some, and then when I go to bed, I think about them. So it's basically my whole life. Frogs can make good pets, provided you choose carefully. Some are active, some eat bugs or mice, some hibernate, and some don't do much. 
but they all need careful looking after and have specific needs. In captivity, frogs live on average between 5 and 14 years. If you're going to look after an animal, you need to look after it properly. You can't skimp. You've got to understand that they've got to have the correct environment. Heating um, is a big problem, and feeding as well. Uh, a lot of people don't like keeping frozen mice in their freezers. The freezer's better now that Alexander has got the frozen goods in one drawer rather than spread in amongst the ice creams and the fish fingers. Before bringing an amphibian or reptile home, make sure you know what it eats. The amount of food you offer will depend on the size and feeding patterns. It's illegal to use live animals, so when using humanely pre-killed mammals, ensure they're fully defrosted for digestion. We keep the frozen rodents because they're easy to feed. They don't need to be fed themselves, like live would. And also, they're completely safe for your animals, whereas if you had live, they can actually fight back. My dream animal would be a blood python or a boa, and I'm, I'm looking to get one um, in a few weeks. I don't think Mum knows my plans, but she'll understand, maybe. Waiting patiently to see the vet are friends Claire and Michelle. They've brought in ferret brothers, both with mobility problems. This is a job for Martin. So what brings you and the ferret to the clinic today? Um, Foster's does walk on his back legs, but not very well on his front. And Marshmallow doesn't walk at all on his back legs. Right, OK. Do you have many ferrets? Yes. <laughs> How many is many? About 80. 80? <laughs> wow. 80. Claire and Michelle have been keeping ferrets for 16 years. My first two ferrets I got from a rescue, and then Eventually, through the years, we started rescuing ferrets and we ended up keeping most of what came through. And I have about 85 ferrets. I've got 45 ferrets. It costs about £300 a month to buy all their food and the sawdust and vet bills. They, they can be expensive if you get more than one and two. These ferret fans find it impossible to turn away any newcomers. You can always find a reason why one more just won't hurt. I would say the number one. Um, I've got a 14-year-old son. Uh, he knows that I have to do my ferrets before I do anything else in a day. These ferrets are an active, playful bunch. <laughs> Unlike Marshmallow and Foster's, who definitely need Martin's help. Oh, come on, Marshmallow, let's have a feel at these. Ooh, we've got some kinky tibias. The tibias this equivalent to this bone here and I should feel them as being straight and they've got a curve and that's why we are, well, looking a bit like a penguin, really, <laughs> even though we're a ferret. As for Foster's and his front legs... This one's not too bad. This one has got a bit of a curl and a twist on them. Now, let's just pop them on the table and see if we can get a bit of movement and see how they're getting on. Oh, we are walking. The one with the forelegs doesn't seem as badly affected as the one... No, this, this one doesn't walk. It just shuffles. It may well be that there could be a degree of inbreeding going on here. He's just really struggling. Come on, babes. How do you manage your breeding ferrets? When I breed my own ferrets, they're not related. Um, we, we keep records of who parents are through generations before we decide to breed any of our ferrets. Ferrets that are closely related have genetic defects, are temperamental, or over the age of four should not be used for breeding. The one with the front legs seems to be, relatively speaking, a happy ferret. Yes, he is. And may well be able to cope. This poor guy, Marshmallow, doesn't seem to be coping well at all. Mm -hmm. I think that. In this case, unfortunately, it's going to be kind of being put to sleep. He hasn't got no quality of life, so I think that is the best thing for him. To send Marshmallow to sleep, Martin will give him two injections of anaesthetic. The first will anaesthetise Marshmallow, making him unconscious. 
The second shot will bring his heart to a stop. It's quick and peaceful, and deemed the kindest way to bring an animal's life to a close. In a minute or so's time, we'll go floppy. Then after that, I'm going to give him another injection to, to stop the heart. Okay. At only 12 weeks old, it's an end to a very short life. Just fading away now. Marshmallow's case highlights the importance of responsible breeding. It's the worst part of my job. But when they're suffering, it is a last act of kindness that we can do. We can prevent that final suffering. The UK is home to dozens of zoos and animal centres. Each week, our vets are out and about working alongside specialists up and down the country, dealing with all creatures, great and small. This week, Paul's off to Twycross Zoo. Open for 47 years, the zoo is home to over a thousand animals. And today, Paul's getting up close and personal with an elephant. The zoo currently has five Asian elephants, including VJ, only 11 months old. As Asian elephants are endangered, new births are major news, and the zoo is keen to add to the family. They're part of a breeding programme here, which is really, really important for conservation. We've got a male calf behind us there, which was one of the first born in captivity, and he looks absolutely fantastic. But with no breeding male at Twycross, six weeks ago Tara was artificially inseminated, and today she's having a pregnancy test. Wow, this is Tara. For zoo vet Nick Masters, this is not an everyday occurrence. The plan today is to give her a scan, a okay. transrectal scan, so we're going right. to go up her backside and have a look through the rectal wall at her reproductive tract and try and establish whether or not she's pregnant. OK. It's an embryonic vesicle if it's there at the moment, and it's about so it's you know, a half a centimetre of fat across. Elephant. Yeah, so okay. it might be difficult to find. In order to get a clear picture, Tara needs an elephant enema. We're just going to check that it's not ice cold water for her because that's going to put her off a bit. Now, I presume she's had enemas before. Enemas before. Good, that's good. not the first time, so okay. she's very well trained. After a bit of preparation, Nick gets down to business. Well, once you get inside and she relaxes, it's fairly cavernous, but it's always full of these faecal balls that they're constantly producing. So, as you'll see in a minute. <laughs> Mind out back there because. As I bring these out, they're going to go that way. With elephants eating up to 16 hours a day, that's a lot of waste disposal. Come in. So we've got to move pretty quickly with this scan, haven't we, now? Well, I just want to get in there really before yeah. it fills up the faeces again. So how big's an elephant's uterus at kind of Tara's age? Anything from about 50 centimetres to 80 centimetres. The insemination cost £10,000, so there's a lot riding on the result. Where is it? Rectal scans are common in large animals. It doesn't hurt, and it gives a much clearer picture than an external scan. That's one of the horns of the uterus going yeah. off to the side. So, something... This is it here. And there's a little black dot there's there, There's a little black there? dot right in yeah. the middle. That looks pretty promising, doesn't it? I can't <laughs> What we could do is we'll video it for a little bit. I think we'll stop there because my arm's about to die. <laughs> Good girl. Brilliant, Sarah. Thank you. So this is the right horn of the uterus. And within it, in the centre of it, in the right position, and about the right size, is this little black, more or less circular structure here. So, Nick, could we be looking at a baby elephant? Let's hope so. Um, we, we could be, but I'm certainly not 100% sure. If you're ovulated on the left side, yeah. this probably isn't a pregnancy. If you're ovulated on the right side, this could well be. So there's a chance Tara might be pregnant. But this won't be confirmed until an embryonic heartbeat can be detected. These are really intelligent, very, very sociable animals, and it's paramount that they're having babies and Absolutely. learning all about that. Keep so. them going, yeah. Find out if Tara and Twycross get good news later. Coming up, 
Paul has a sticky problem. That does look like horrible snotty gunk. James takes on the fatties. If you open him up to do any surgery on him and your hands are going to be like dipping into oil. And is Max facing the chop? <laughs> we do love our pets, but we can go too far. A recent survey revealed that one in three dogs are overweight. And there are plenty of tubby tabbies and rotund rabbits out there too. Yeah. Obesity causes all kinds of health problems, including reduced life expectancy, diabetes and pressure on the joints. So James and Gemma are taking on the fatties. The problem is, Owen is feeding far too many table scraps, far too many treats. A treat here, a treat there. I really want to get the message out there, it's not acceptable to have a fat pet. You need to get to the vets, get a diet plan and take control. Four brave owners with four fat pets are taking our challenge to fight the flab. Welcome to Fat Camp. First up, Julie and Litz. Ten-year-old Litz is a resident of Four Paws Cat Rescue in Oxford. Originally, we got Litz from a lady who loved him, but she was killing him with kindness, and this is the result. And while Julie tries everything to get Litz moving... Come on. Carrying so much excess weight means he's a little on the... hmm, lethargic side. <sighs> the average weight for a short-haired cat is four to five kilos. Litz hits the scales at a hefty 9.6. Come on, fatty. Twice the size. Yeah, at least twice the size. This guy is just a big blob. He literally moulds to the table. And if you film, his abdomen's just huge. That is all fat in there. You open him up to do any surgery on him and your hands are going to be, like, dipping into oil. Look at all yeah. his fur coming out. And um, if you look at his skin, he's got a little bit of dandruff there. Yes, he has, yeah. I mean, that's because he's, he's so fat he can't get to his back. What did the previous owner feed? Well, she used to give him rich foods like chicken, fish. I'm sure he had the odd saucer of milk. Why? I mean, in the wild, they're not going out milking cows. <laughs> and one glass of milk is yeah. equivalent to five chocolate bars. 60% of these fatties get diabetes. Yep. He's heading for an early grave he if is. we don't get this yep. under control. So what is he fed at the moment? He's on a special diet at the moment for his crystals. Fat cats, exactly like him, are more yep. prone to crystals. Bladder crystals are formed from minerals in the urine. These sharp shards can irritate the bladder. Male cats have a narrow urethra, which can become blocked by the crystals stopping urination, which is potentially life-threatening. How long has he been on the crystal diet for? Nearly two years. Yeah. After two years, I'm sure they're gone. The idea of the diet I'm going to put you on is to prevent them happening. And we need to get him exercising. Get that lead out, more walking is right. definitely going to be on the menu for him. Next up, it's Kaylee and a rather large rabbit. This is Lola Rose. She is one year, four month old. She is a mini lop. Yes, you heard right. She's a mini lop. The average weight for a mini lop is around 1.5 kilos. At 2.75, Lola is almost twice the size she should be. She's obviously massively overweight. And this massive, like, a dewlap here. I mean, that's uh, not a good sign. What, yeah, what she can... can't actually clean herself underneath. These guys, if they can't clean their back ends, the flies basically yeah. will just lay eggs. They'll get maggots and pretty much eat them alive from yeah. the back end. So that's definitely a really good reason to try and get weight off, yeah. a, off a rabbit. Rabbits need lots of fibre to keep their gut healthy and their teeth trimmed. Include a good supply of hay and vegetables, but go easy on the pellets. Kaylee is feeding Lola all the right things, so why is this bunny so overweight? She's not very active. She's got loads of toys to play with, but she doesn't really seem to be interested. She's uh, sleep. Lola's problem, basically, is she's not doing enough. She needs to be outside and get moving. A good little trick, actually, is a brown paper bag yeah. and hiding pellets in there. She'll start ripping it about, and it's all exercise. So as she's exercising, she's losing the calories instead of just being sat there. Next to face the scales is Simon and Milo. Four-year-old Finnish Lapunt Milo is definitely packing a few extra kilos. Lack of exercise, perhaps? We walk regularly, two walks a day, two, three, four miles. The wrong diet? We feed him a proprietary dietary food. Well, there must be some explanation for these excess pounds. 
when we were at puppy class and when I was told that when he barks, to tell him to be quiet and then to give him a treat. <coughs> I think he's remembered that. <coughs> he's quite a bright dog, really. Tipping the scales at 22 kilos, Milo is carrying up to five kilos of excess fat. In every dog that's overweight, we need a starting point. We need to know what's wrong. In people, they have the body mass index. In dogs and cats, we body condition score. OK. Basically, place either, both hands either side of the ribs. Fine. And feel, OK? okay. Do you want to come and have a feel? Yeah, sure. In ideal body condition, a dog's ribs can be felt without excess fat covering them. And yes, you can try this at home. I can't feel those. What sort of things does uh, Milo get fed? He gets a diet food, a mixture of kibble and uh, a wet food. Can I ask what's in that pouch? Is that his treats? Um, Pepperami. I mean, really fatty food. Not great for a dog on a diet. This is a disease, <laughs> OK? I Obesity is a disease. Yes. People don't see it as that, but it <laughs> is. It's serious because it can affect his life, and we cannot ignore that. So to get Milo back into shape, those fatty treats have got to go. Finally, remember that fat skunk, Reuben? Well, fortunately, his blood results were all clear. But Michel's back, this time with his housemate, Pandora. Ideally, skunks should weigh around three kilos. At nearly six, Pandora could have swallowed a whole other skunk. This is a big concern in skunks. They're all generally overweight, mm -hmm. and uh, there's so many health issues with this. I mean, I knew she was overweight, but actually seeing it, it's terrible. Just like Reuben, Pandora's weight problem began with her previous owner feeding her biscuits. Michelle has already cut these out of both skunks' diets, but James has another trick up his sleeve. I think it'd be great to get them doing some exercise, get them moving. So I think we could suggest doing some hydrotherapy. It's not common. I've never referred a skunk for hydrotherapy. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but it's a great way to get them moving. Good for the joints, because there's no pressure on them. They're burning energy. And hopefully, you never know, they might actually enjoy it. So that's our fat campers. I'm well done. We'll be following their progress as they up the exercise and curb the calories in a bid to shed the excess flab. But who will triumph? I think going forward, you're just doing everything right. And who will fall by the wayside? In seven weeks, we've not lost a thing. So what have you been doing? Next, waiting patiently for vet Paul, is four-year-old basset hound Pickle, with owners Louise and Amelia. She's very loyal, very affectionate. Um, it's that she can't see properly, because like, top of her eyelids are coming down. She doesn't have a full vision, so she does get a little bit stroppy. Just for her to see properly would be nice. So what's the problem with Pickle today? Um, basically, a few months ago, her eyes started looking a bit sore, and she started getting these sort of green, gunky stuff in her yeah. eyes. And since then, it's been getting worse and worse. And there's a lot of it as well, isn't there? It's quite gross, isn't it, poor girl? I bet this is all over your house, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Especially up my clothes. It's her eyes. She does. She rubs them all over you. I mean, it's normal for bassets to have quite droopy eyes, but hers is just a bit too pronounced, isn't it? On the bottom, it's almost like this kind of diamond shape. And yeah. I think she has got a condition called diamond eye, which is where the ligaments at the side of the eye, these ones up here, yeah. um, are really, really slack. So the whole eye just sags down. It's exposed to the air. It's not getting any moisture to it, and it just ends up with this mucky infection. And she can't blink properly to clear it away. Diamond eye most commonly occurs in breeds with exaggerated facial features, such as bloodhounds, St Bernards, bulldogs and basset hounds. It leaves the eye open to infection, which can lead to a mucoid discharge just like pickles. How many times a day do you have to clean them? About three or four times. That's quite a lot, isn't it? It is. It's quite disgusting, isn't it? That's what you have to deal with every day, yeah. and that does look like horrible, snotty gunk. I think if we left her, she'd get a lot, lot worse. So I think really the only option would be surgery. If we tighten up those eyelids on either side like that, that sagginess is gone. So I think if you're happy with that, I think that's the way we need to go with her. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Okay. I would never support cosmetic surgery to change a dog's appearance, ever. Uh, but in this case, if we don't fix this problem, then it's going to seriously affect Pickle's welfare. But can Paul pull off this complicated surgery? 
It's actually a bigger job than I thought it was, really. Earlier, Aaron and Rio brought their staffy Max to the surgery to see Cat. He's currently pleasuring himself several times a day. But having lost a previous dog under anaesthetic, Aaron and Rio are concerned about having Max castrated. Cat has sent them to visit Birmingham Dogs Home, where hopefully seeing so many unwanted dogs might persuade them to change their minds. Birmingham Dogs Home currently has 87 dogs in its kennels. Shockingly, over half are pure and crossbred staffies. You see, you know, they want to get out, they don't want to get out. They just want to take them all. But... The rescue centre has certainly made an impression. I was very upset. It's quite shocking, really, yes. that almost every one of them is a staff. It just made me think there's no way I would want to mm. breed Max and bring more puppies into the world. If they can't find homes for that many unwanted dogs, then it's, uh, I'd probably struggle to find homes for, for more, so... Yeah, we should... We probably will be probably getting castrated now, yeah. I would have thought. So it looks like Max is getting the chop. A few days later, he's booked in for surgery with Cat. I'm just hoping it will calm him down. Mm. He will hopefully be a lot happier. Whilst Max is prepped for his castration, Cat scrubs in. OK. It's a very straightforward operation, and she does it regularly. The castration is going to help Max and his masturbation issues because, first of all, with taking away the testicles, we're taking away his ability to ejaculate, which is obviously the pleasurable point of masturbation. So that's the testicle still sitting in its sac. And then we just gently open that up, and out he comes. Um, and it should generally make him a calmer, happier, less stressed out dog. With one testicle out, Cat's got one more to remove. And with the last sutra and final snip, Max's castration is over. There we go. Second one out. All done. But with no balls, will Max change his ways? Find out later. Sherman, the cat-nipping tortoise, needs expert help to cure his ways. Owner Sarah is fed up with him attacking her cats. So today, she has an appointment with reptile expert Neil Forbes to try and get to the bottom of Sherman's bullying behaviour. Come on, my friend. There we go. After a thorough examination, Neil's happy Sherman's physically in good shape. He's obviously a very sort of extrovert, brave, forward little tortoise. A lot of tortoises we see here in this situation will be pulling his head inside and being frightened, whereas he is obviously a more sort of uh, macho chap. And I think that's partly what feeds into his behaviour towards the kitten. Yeah. Do you know anything about his history? No, I only know that he was gifted to me from a friend. Do you know if they had any cats and dogs? Yeah, she certainly had cats and dogs. You know, there could be something in that household that has sensitised him. It's certainly possible that he's had some sort of shocking or frightening event um, which might involve a cat oh. where he felt frightened of them. So I really feel that this is a, a question of protecting either himself or protecting his territory or protecting his food. He sees them as a predator yeah. and he wants yeah. to scare them off. He's yeah. oh, I'm going to be a big which boy. Which sounds about right, actually. In the way the he's way behaving. He is, yeah. Yeah. Is there anything I can do when he does attack the kittens? It's not like a dog, you can't say, Sherman, stop. stop that, be good, it's OK, chill. Sherman deserves to live in a territory where he doesn't feel threatened. What I would suggest is if there are areas where he and the cats are going to come into conflict, um, we, we want to try and control that, quite honestly, keep any dogs and cats out of the way. So it could be a previous bad experience that has left Sherman terrified of cats and feeling defensive. Sarah has no choice but to keep the animals separate and following Neil's advice has got Sherman his own run in the garden. Yeah, I'd say um, Sherman being in his run now isn't, it's not as bad as it used to be because they're segregated really, aren't they? And he can't be as aggressive. It'll take some time for him to change his ways, but hopefully both Sherman and the cats will learn to live in harmony. He's one of a kind and I wouldn't swap him for the world. Coming up, 
Will there be the pitter-patter of baby elephant's feet at Twycross? And has castration broken Max's habit? So how's this masturbating men? It's surgery day for Pickle. This four-year-old Basset Hound has been suffering with a nasty eye condition that can only be rectified by a very delicate operation. We're going to try and do a little bit of an eye lift today. We're trying to basically make the functional uh, eyelid much better by lifting it all up and by reducing the size of the lower lid. So it's a lot of fiddly, fiddly surgery and it's very difficult to get it right, but hopefully today we're going to improve the condition. Even if we improve it a little bit, then it's going to make Pickle a lot happier. But once Pickle is prepped, Paul finally gets a really good look at the problem. Once all the hair's clipped up, it's actually a bigger job than I thought it was, really. We're actually going to have to try and lift this whole area up. Maybe take some muscle from round here and actually attach it to the skull up here, which I've never done before. Paul starts the procedure on Pickle's left eye. Okay, I'm starting to make the first incision now. See how we get on. We've got the muscle here. And basically, we just need to put them up together, make a new muscle, and we're going to stitch them up here. That muscle is now pulling the eye in that direction. Like human cosmetic surgery, this type of eyelid correction can substantially change the shape of the eyes. So Paul needs to work carefully to get a good match. What I don't want to happen is to pull that muscle up too far, because then we're going to end up with a total, like, deer in headlights type look. With the left eye lifted, Paul moves on to the right. You just look at how baggy that lower lid is. Almost get you shopping in that, I think. Whereas on this side, it's uh, much tighter. The ligament's obviously holding that eyelid in much higher position. It looks a lot better. As there's even more bagginess to correct on the right eye, Paul has to trim away some of the excess. And once the right eye is lifted, there's just one job left for Paul. We've tightened up what's there, but we just need to reduce the amount that's there as well. So I'm going to do what's called a wedge resection. After a quick trim of both bottom eyelids, this two-hour operation is finally over. The main aim of this whole surgery was to stop pickles getting these eye infections. How it looks to me isn't as important, as long as the animal's more comfortable and is suffering less from eye problems, then that, to me, is job done. It's been five weeks since Pickle's eye surgery, and today she's back with Louise and Amelia. Hi there, you're right. So Paul can check on her progress. Whoa, we go. They look a lot more open, don't they? I mean, before, I remember, they were just so crusty and horrible. Are you having to bathe the eyes still? Yeah, I'm still having to do it, but okay. not, as, not as much. Not as, as much. Are you, are you happy with the end result? I am, yeah. I don't think anyone would notice that she's had a little sort of eye lift. It looks quite natural when the hair grows back, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it looks uh, a bit kind of Frankenstein at first, doesn't it, with it all the stitches? When she, but... was, when she was all shaved around the eyes and that, yeah. it did look quite shocking, but yeah. it's improved so much and it does... She just looks so much better now. She looks fab, doesn't she? You look great. And you can see us as well. We can see you. She can definitely see her dinner more as well. <laughs> it's final checkup time for Max. After his castration two months ago, has his little habit been cured? The last time I saw Max was obviously when we took his uh, testicles off. So how's this masturbating been? It's stopped completely now. Really? Yes, he attempted it once and then he gave up. And he My hasn't done it since, goodness. so it has worked. I'm absolutely amazed because you neuter the dog and that gets rid of half the problem, but often you have to do behavioural mm. and training, don't you, to, to really stop it. So, I mean, it really shows us that Max was a complete slave to his hormones, wasn't he? <laughs> but he's not missed them. No, not at all. No. He seems fine, happy. Good. Well, he hasn't told us so, anyway. <laughs> And he's healed absolutely yep. beautifully, hasn't he? Yes. Yep. In fact, you would never even know <laughs> that they had been there, <laughs> would you? No. no. So since we've had him, it's been a problem, so, yeah. um, so you know, a it's, relief it's a relief now that he's finally Over. sorted out. We can all relax a bit now. <laughs> we've had such a dramatic change that I really think that this is it for Max now. 
Back at Twycross, Tara's pregnancy results are through. And it's good news. She's three months pregnant. Only 19 more to go before she gives birth. Great news for Twycross and the Asian elephant population.